Hi everyone! In this talk I'm going to talk about what lies in word embeddings. But before we go in depth in word embeddings, let's consider a quick experiment that we can just go ahead and do. What I can do is I can download some news headlines, and these news headlines might have text in it, uh, something like good weather. And what I can do is I can train a deep learning system to predict the next character. So for example, looking at a headline like this, it starts with the letter G, and then I get the letter O, then I get the letter O, letter O again, then an O and a D, a D and then a space that you would have right here, etc. But what I can do, just for the experiment, is I can train myself a neural network to predict the next letter. And here's the architecture that you might use to go about that. You start with the character, let's say at position T, that's somewhere along the title, and that character can be represented as a 37-dimensional one-hot encoded array. I have 26 letters, I have 10 numbers, and I've got the white space character. So I only need 37 indices to represent all of the letters. Now, next what I can do is I can hook that up to, let's say, a feed-forward layer. And after this, I would have another feed-forward layer. And let's say that this feed-forward layer has an activation function, something like softmax maybe, such that the outputs on the final layer sum up to one. And then the goal is that the final layer represents our predictions for the next character. So what's going to happen now is that because on this side I've got an input and because on this side I've got an output, I can calculate what sort of errors I'm making. And this gives me a gradient signal that's going to move back from the output, updating this feed-forward layer, and that's going to propagate and update this feed-forward layer. And what's relatively interesting about this is that this model kind of gives us two outputs if you think about it. The first output are, of course, these probabilities and these classifications. But let's say now that I've got a two-dimensional array over here, then I also have this representation of a character internally. It's this compressed floating point array that should have a lot of information about, you know, the characters that I put in here. And this is something that people like to call an embedding. So what I'm going to do is just show you what's happening when we actually run this training procedure. So here's a visualization of both the embedding and the predictions. Over here, you see predictions that are being made. Given this letter coming in, then this is the letter that we're predicting. And the more yellow it is, the higher the probability. And over here, you see how every letter is sort of projected in this two-dimensional space. Now, it's a bit random now because the neural network hasn't trained on anything just yet, hasn't seen any data. But what I'm about to do is I'm about to hit the train button and then we'll see how over time this image and this image is going to update, just to see what happens both to the internal representation of a letter and to the predictions that go out. You should now see that things are updating. This guy over here is converging, but the more interesting thing is actually happening on this side. We are starting to see clusters appear. By adding this I would argue somewhat artificial label. We're just predicting the next token. But by adding that, we have a training procedure to go from a letter to a two-dimensional representation. And if you squint your eyes, you'll notice that there are some interesting clusters that appear from the get-go. We can see that all the vowels and consonants are separate. There's a little cluster over here with all sorts of numbers. And we also see that the white character, or the space bar, also is sort of its own region, so to say. So we have somewhat logical clusters. And what I can also do is I can start playing around with what kind of clusters that I might get. What I can do is I can add more or less data and see if I get slightly different kinds of clusters. So here's another example of some of these clusters that have been created. And again, we see similar clusters, but they are in a different place. So all the letters are over here, vowels and consonants are separate, the numbers are over here, and again, the white space again has its own region. 
One thing that we can see here is that by introducing this fake label, so to say, we have found ourselves a interesting unsupervised method of clustering letters. And the fact that this works for letters can make us wonder, can we do maybe a similar thing for words? Just like a letter is part of a word, a word is part of a sentence or a paragraph or a document. And it might be possible that by using a similar method, we can get similar properties. However, a very important question to ask ourselves at this point in time, what lies in these word embeddings? We're gonna maybe wanna do this in higher dimensions for words, so we gotta start wondering, what properties can we actually expect when we do this? And while we explore what lies in word embeddings, I hope that you recognize that there are two interpretations of this word. So let's now say we're gonna go ahead and start training the system, not for letters, but for proper word embeddings. Then we should recognize that a couple of things are definitely different. For starters, we're not gonna have 37 odd tokens here. That's not gonna cut it. Instead, it's more likely that we have, let's say starting from 20,000 tokens here, probably a lot more. And for a very similar reason, we're probably not gonna have two dimensions here Odds are that we might go for something more like 300. If you think about all the different clusters that we might get with actual words instead of just letters, then two dimensions might not be enough space to compress all that information in. Another thing that's bound to be different is this label over here. Again, we're not going to have 37 tokens, it's more like 20,000. So this label over here probably also will have many more outputs. Let's say that someone somewhere took the effort of actually doing this on a huge data set with lots of compute power. That means that we have a very convenient mapping from this word to this vector for that word. And the idea and kind of the hope is that that vector summarizes a lot of information about that word. What we've effectively built is some sort of system that can take text and can give us a numeric representation. This is what the embedding does. And this is also where we can sort of draw the line where we say, this is something that you can pre-compute. And then let's say that you have a custom task. The hope is that you can take this pre-computed numeric representation, and then maybe the only thing you need is to put a support vector machine in here, plus your own labels. And then the hope is if this numeric representation, if that indeed has been trained on something that's very big and very general, then maybe your custom task is much easier to solve. The hope is that during this pre-compute step, someone has been able to compress all relevant information down into a vector, such as the only thing you need to do is to just put one extra layer of training after it with your own labels. This was the dream, at least, that was announced when people first started doing this. Unfortunately though, it's really not perfect. So let's not talk about a use case where these embeddings fall short. I work for a company called Raza and we make open source tools to help anyone make conversational agents that perform very well under a wide range of circumstances. One thing that we see all the time is spelling errors. For example, someone doesn't type university, but instead types univer city. Another way to describe a spelling error in this case is to look at it as a out of vocabulary situation. The issue is that this way of spelling maybe didn't occur in our training data, and therefore we will not have an index for it in our sparse array, and that can have the consequence that the embedding that we have for it will just be a dense vector that just contains zeros. There's a couple of ways that you can deal with this. At Raza, a very common trick is to just use count vectors that use n-grams. What we can do is we can say, well, let's just, for example, look at the trigrams of university. Here's some examples. If we can have a one-hot encoded representation of those and pass those along to our machine learning pipeline instead of just these dense vectors, then we are a little bit more robust against these phenomena. That said, embeddings can use a very similar trick. Because you can take these trigrams and use those as input. The idea behind this is that if you have, let's say, university in your training example, then you can separate that into subtokens that each will go into the sparse array. And then it's up to the gradient update to make sure that these weights all have an appropriate value. 
but you would still get this one-to-one -one mapping from a word to a vector. In this case, should for whatever reason there be a spelling error, and let's say this word here would be different, then what would effectively happen is maybe some of these trigrams would go away. Let's say maybe this one. And whenever this happens, you might lose some information, but you wouldn't lose all the information. So you would still be robust against some spelling errors or some out of vocabulary tokens. If you look online, you can find an implementation called Fast Text, and it has about 150 pre-trained languages with this property attached. It's trained using subtokens. The main downside of the approach is that because you have to train for all of these separate subtokens, that the embeddings themselves can be six to seven gigabytes big. But there is another trick that you can do to maybe get subword embeddings that are a bit more lightweight. I've written down some words, and let's think about them. If I want to represent them, do I really need to have all of the trigrams or n-grams? Or can it maybe be a bit more clever that I only take certain subwords out of all the possible ones? In particular, if I have a look at these words, I hope you would agree that for all of these professions and sciences, the first part of the word explains what kind of science it is, and the second part of the word represents whether we're talking about the person doing the science or the science itself. You can kind of look at these words as if they have morphological features that a lot of these words can have meaning because it's basically a combination of two other meanings. And you can imagine that we do this pre-processing procedure where we look at the English language and we just do this compression technique where we just ask, hey, what might be an effective subword allocation? Given that we only want to have 30,000 subwords, please find the ones that are the most effective, that they cover the most ground. And there's this byte pair technique that can do that pre-processing beforehand for you. And once you have that, you will have another list of subwords like astro, geo, topo, g, and gist, let's say. Let's pretend that these are the subwords. And then you can still encode those just like before. These embeddings also exist. They are known as byte pair embeddings. And these have been pre-trained in over 275 languages, and you can get these in much smaller or much bigger sizes if you're interested. Some of these embeddings are just megabytes, so this can be seen as a lightweight variant of fast text. So I hope with these explanations it's clear how these embeddings came to be. But we maybe now should start talking about some of the properties that they may or may not possess. Figuring out what information exactly is encoded in a 300-dimensional array is tricky. Also, there's many different pre-trained languages out there, so what I've done in the past year is I've made this tool called What Lies. It's a tool that helps explain what lies in these word embeddings, and although I won't be doing a tutorial here, I will use it to demonstrate some properties that you can expect from these word embeddings. In particular, what I'm doing here is I am using what lies to fetch me some information from Spacey. I am taking their English core language, and I'm just asking it to fetch me similar tokens to university. The way that's happening right now is I'm saying, well, let's just take two vectors and let's look at this angle between them. And this is happening in 300 dimensions, but that angle between those two vectors, that is known as a cosine distance. And Based on that, I'm asking, fetch me the similar tokens. And you see here that when you use Spacey, university is fine, it can fetch things that are reasonable. But the moment that you make a spelling error, it suddenly becomes very hard to get anything reasonable, basically because Spacey will assign a vector of zeros to this token right now. If I were to do the same thing with fast text, the results would be different. Here are the examples without the spelling error, and here are the examples with the spelling error. One thing you'll notice is that the distances here in general are definitely bigger, but despite these bigger distances, we do see lots of reasonable results coming back here. It's better than spacey when it comes to this task. If you further squint your eyes, you're gonna see something that's interesting. Notice that universe cities, if you misspell it, it suddenly has cities as a subword in there. If you have a look at some of the words that we get back, places, 
arena, countries, venues, then it seems that FastX is able to recover to some degree. So I thought this example was nice because it does really show how subword embeddings can be useful, but it's still a mixed bag and if you're not careful. What I'm doing after is I'm doing the same thing with byte pair embeddings. And here you see that byte pair is actually having a fair bit of difficulty here. Apparently the subwords that were chosen don't fit this particular use case too well. So you could say that fast text can be better in this particular case, but there are situations where you have out of vocabulary words where suddenly byte pair performs a lot better. The example that I like to use to show this is the zergling mitosis word. The main thing I would like to emphasize here is that zergling mitosis, it's a word that totally doesn't exist. But I hope that you would agree that because of the mitosis at the end of the word, as a human, I might think, ah, oh, it's probably something of a disease. And the interesting thing here is that byte pair gets this way better than fast text. If you look at the byte pair results over here at the bottom, it seems that the way that it's working is it's able to zoom in on only this mitosis part. Probably what's happening here is that this mitosis subword is one of the subwords that byte pair was able to train on. And it's ignoring everything else in the word. Fast text cannot do that. Fast text will actually look at all the n-grams that it has in its vocabulary and it will try to do something with it. And what I think is happening in this case is that because we have a capital letter over here, fast text is sort of assuming that this is probably a name of a person, which is why we see uh, Johnson and Barry and Wilson. So these subword embeddings, they can help with this out of vocabulary situation, but we do need to be careful because they're definitely not perfect. And speaking of not being perfect, let's talk about what we're actually doing here. When we retrieve items that are similar in embedded space, does that mean that we are retrieving items that have the same meaning? The answer is a resounding no, that's totally not what's happening. And a really good example of that is to fetch words like fast and slow. Because as far as embedded space goes, slow and fast are really, really similar. If you think about how the words are being used in a sentence, they are really similar. They describe the speed of something. So grammatically, if you were to replace the word fast with the word slow, it would still be a grammatically correct sentence. However, words that are really similar in embedded space, they can be opposites of each other as far as meaning goes. These word embeddings simply do not represent meaning of a word. They represent how a word is typically being used in a sentence, which is a proxy for meaning, but it's certainly a different thing. And it's important to get that right if you're going to be using these pre-trained embeddings in your machine learning pipeline, then you should be aware that because it's not representing actual meaning, that it might be representing something that you don't want. So let's talk about bias. What I'm showing you here is a similarity chart. And one thing that we can see, for example, is that the word woman and the word nurse seem to have a larger similarity than man and nurse. And if you squint your eyes a little bit, you'll also see that man is a little bit more similar to programmer than woman. And here's where the danger can happen. Suppose that these are my words and that they live in 2D space. Well, then one thing that will be highly unfortunate is if the direction from man to woman correlates a little bit with the direction from programmer to nurse. However, I do hope that you agree that language in general is not unbiased. So if there's bias in the data, odds are that our embeddings might be picking that up and amplifying it. If I were to maybe train a resume classifier or something like that, then there's a risk that there's going to be a decision boundary kind of along an axis where men get one type of job and women get another type of job. And this is really dangerous because there is no reason why a man couldn't be a nurse or why a woman couldn't be a programmer but this is something to really take serious. And just for good measure, it is relatively easy to make a visualization like this that will help to convince you that indeed we can measure that this bias is somehow in these embeddings. If you take a look at the direction from nurse to physician, that's a direction in embedded space, and it seems that that direction is quite similar to the direction of mother-father.
Now, if I'm thinking about the actual meaning of the word, that should not happen. However, since these embeddings are merely learning how these words are being used, we do have this recipe for a dangerous scenario happening if we're not careful. There are some debiasing techniques that try to mitigate this bias. However, the ones that I've tried so far all seem to fail. And I just want to spend a little bit of time explaining how this is happening and why. So here's how a debiasing technique might work. Let's say that we've got this access from man to woman, let's say, and the main concern that we have is that potentially the access from programmer to nurse is similar. One linear algebra trick that we could do is we could say, well, let's take that access, let's have it go through the origin, and let's now make a projection that's at 90 degrees with that. So this is a 90 degree angle right there. Now the idea here is that if this axis were actually to represent gender, everything on this line would have gender equal to zero. And theoretically, that means that I might be able to just go ahead and project words down onto that axis. And the hope is that by moving these points this way, that you might be able to remove some of the gender bias. Because in this case, right, man, woman, it's closer together and programmer and nurse are also closer together. So we might have been able to remove a lot of bias. And in fact, we can quantify this to some extent. Let's say that we take our 300 dimensions and we actually apply this trick. We calculate the gender axis, calculate a plane, project everything onto that plane and hope for the best. Then I can indeed quantify that this correlation that I had before is now much less. And we could convince ourselves right now that, hey, there's an improvement. We can report that we're doing a good thing. But here is where you have to be super careful. There's still plenty of bias left, even though this one metric is reporting a good improvement. And it's not just the fact that we're only considering gender here. The real issue is that we've barely changed the internal representation. To understand that, we have to consider how word embeddings are used in practice. In practice, word embeddings are used kind of as a pre-processing step. You have words that you start out with, then you pass it along to something like fast text, and then you get this numeric representation that you can give to a scikit-learn model and then use to make a prediction. Note that doing this in scikit-learn is made a whole lot easier by this what lies package as well. Every language backend that we support is also usable as a featureizer inside of scikit-learn. So bypair, fast text, spacey, hugging face, all of those you can just use directly here. That also means that we can do a bit of an experiment. What I can do is I can create a data set where half the words are super masculine and other words are super feminine. Man, woman, king, queen, these kinds of words. Words where there's definitely a gender attached. And what I can do is I can train this pipeline and then report on how well my test set is being predicted. When I do that, without concerning myself about debiasing, I get about a 90% accuracy on my test set. But now let's say I make a small change. Now let's say that I'm keeping my train set as is, but this test set, that is going to be debiased using the technique that I mentioned before. So we're going to be doing lots of these projections. And then this debiased set, that is what I'll be using to predict. Now, if this trick were to work, now, if we actually did proper debiasing, I hope you would agree that I would get maybe a 50% accuracy now because I'm removing all the gender information. But it turns out if I do this, we get an 81% accuracy still left. So even if we're trying to predict explicit masculine feminine words, this debiasing trick, sure, it removes some predictive power, but to call this debiased will be wrong. So right now, you might be confused. You might wonder, well, we saw the cosine distances go down, so why isn't the accuracy much lower? It's actually kind of easy to give an explanation for that, but to do that, we have to consider what happens when we do this in not two, but three dimensions. 
What I've got here is a three-dimensional plot of some cluster points. And let's say that we have a gender axis that's known up front. You see a lot of dots and they're also colored along this gender axis. So let's say we've got one end over here where everything is dark green and on the side here it's more light green, so to say. If we were now to perform the trick that we just did, but now in three dimensions, we wouldn't be projecting onto a line, we would be projecting onto a plane. And in particular, it'd be this one. All of these points would be moving down and they would be, and they would be plotted on this plane. Again, by using the same argument, because as far as this gender axis is concerned, if you put a dot down here, the gender axis value would remain zero. And to be specific, here's what it looks like. You can notice that the Z axis over here is super flat. And you see that all of those points are smushed onto this flat plane. And of course, because all of these points are now on this plane, we can assume that a lot of these cosine distances are different. But now let's think about what a classifier actually does. A classifier doesn't look at cosine distance. Typically, a classifier looks more at geometric distance. So let's say that in this space we had a classifier, let's say. Then this is a classifier that will be able to separate points on this side from this one quite effectively. And the decision boundary that we have over here, you would still be able to apply that on this flat shape. Smushing points together like this doesn't mean that the clusters suddenly are broken into bits. It might happen, but you don't necessarily have this as a guarantee. And it's this phenomena that makes debiasing incredibly hard. Again, we are not learning the meaning behind a word, we are learning how a word is being used. And that's what's making all of these clusters appear, and we need more than linear algebra and some arithmetic on vectors to add meaning there. But speaking on arithmetic and vectors, there is this other phenomenon that we should discuss before we wrap up. You might have heard of this thing called word analogies. And the most common analogy in this space is if you take king, you subtract from that man, you add woman, well then you might be able to say, well, because king is to man what queen is to woman, that king minus man plus woman should equal queen. And when these word embeddings just came out, this analogy property was heavily marketed. People suggested that there was evidence that when you trained word embeddings in a certain way, that you might be able to get these analogies in them. Unfortunately though, these analogies, they don't seem to hold in many situations, including the famous king queen one. Because the thing that's happening here is related to the thing that was happening with the biasing. What what lies allows me to do is it allows me to fetch the most similar, and below here I've got king that I'm putting into the system, and what I'm doing now is I'm saying, could you, based on cosine distance, get me the, the nearest tokens? And we see kings and queen, and what I can do is I can say, well, I don't want to have the embedding for king, I want to have the embedding for king minus man plus woman, and I want to get the tokens that are most similar to wherever I end up there. And when you run this, Something interesting is happening. So let's zoom in a bit. It seems that when you do king minus man plus woman, that the most similar token isn't queen, it's still king. And to make matters worse, if you look at the distance from king to queen here, and if you look at the distance from queen to this vector here, then it seems that we're even further away. So this claim doesn't seem to hold, at least not for fast text, spacey, and bipair. Those are the languages that I've been trying this on. Now what you could do is you could say, well, I'm not interested in cosine distance, I want to use Euclidean. But the moment that you do that, you get the same result. The numbers are different, but also here, king is on top and the distance for queen has actually increased. So something really fishy is going on here. And I can repeat this exercise for not king and queen, but maybe for host. And here again, we kind of see the same thing. Hostess here is closer to host than wherever we end up after we apply the plus woman minus man arithmetic. So then we got to ask ourselves, you know, what is actually happening when we do minus man and plus woman? And maybe in this case, we should not even 
consider that it might have anything to do with meaning, but let's just now think about clusters instead. We saw before with the whole fairness topic that it was quite useful to think about these word embeddings in terms of clusters, so let's do that again here. Now, what I think is happening is man over here, that's probably in the same cluster as this token here. So then, mathematically, what happens if I take one vector from that cluster, and I take another vector from that cluster, I'm going to add one vector, and I'm going to subtract the other, then odds are that these two vectors just cancel each other out. If two vectors that are similar are being subtracted from each other, what you end up with is perhaps just a little bit of noise. And then what's the result going to be? Well, it's mainly just going to be the, the word that I started with. And that means that we can go back to our king-queen example and maybe start playing around. What if we subtract fast and add slow? Well, we gotta squint our eyes a little bit, but just from glancing at it, it really seems that I'm just keeping the same words here intact. So the most likely thing that's happening here is again that we are just adding and subtracting two terms that cancel each other out. And I hope that this final example demonstrates that we shouldn't think of these word embeddings as a representation of the meaning of a word. So let's wrap up this talk. I thought it would be a good idea to do that in the morning as opposed to in the evening. And then in the morning, I shaved and I forgot that that causes an inconsistency in the video. Sorry about that. But we've been talking about these word embeddings for a while in this video and there's lots of properties about them. However, I would like to end with some advice if you're going to be using these embeddings for your chatbots and digital assistants. You can wonder, if I've got embeddings that are trained on Wikipedia, are they really going to represent language like how it's being used inside of a chatbot? Wikipedia is pretty formal and usually about the past tense, while conversations that you have with a chatbot are present tense and usually really informal with lots of spelling errors. So what can you do in these situations? Well, what you can also do is you can say, instead of predicting the next token and getting an embedding out that way, what I can also do is just maybe predict the intent instead. And that way what you'll get is you'll get a representation in the middle of your neural network that's still an embedding, but it's not trained on all of Wikipedia. Instead, it's trained on your specific use case. And it was surprising at first, but I have seen many digital assistants perform pretty well, actually, without using any embedding whatsoever. What these assistants typically do instead is they focus in on data quality. And given that you have representative data, it seems that you're better off just trying to focus in on that. You might not need something that's heavy and pre-trained. Anyway, having said all that, thanks for listening. If you're interested in more detailed explanations of material I've presented today, definitely check out the algorithm whiteboard. And if you want to investigate what lies in your word embeddings, feel free to pip install what lies. Thanks for listening.